Hello again, everyone. It's been a bit since I've been back here. Um, it's been quite busy, so I've had to do some other recordings first. Uh, but yes, I will try to go back to a regular schedule of posting a lecture a week in the coming week. So this week, our topic is going to be mutations and variations. So if you remember, we've been talking about um, single gene analysis and chi-square, and uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, and we talked about dihybrid crosses as well, um, so multiple gene analyses as well. Uh, after this, after today's lecture next week or next time, I will be posting on what happens when the two genes or more than two genes that you're looking at do not show Mendelian genetics and are um, not showing those ratios that you expected from them. Um, and that's usually because of linkage, because they're too close to each other on the same chromosome in many cases. So we will be talking about that next time. But before we can talk about that, we're going to be just kind of focusing on the same idea of gene analysis and single and dihybrid crosses and look at how different mutations and variations show up. So for this particular chapter uh, lecture, I'm focusing on chapter four in the online open genetics, the Nickel and Barrett text. And then I do have a couple of other uh, links for you, and I'm also going to be posting them in um, the description box so that you can access them for some uh, portion of my lecture. So our goal today, this is kind of the outline of what we are going to be covering today, and we're going to talk about mutations versus polymorphisms. Uh, we are going to think about how these mutations arise, so what is it that uh, originates these mutations, um, we will also talk about how we can use genetic screenings to identify these mutations. We're going to touch base on different types of mutations. Some of these we've talked about in the last few lectures. Others are might be new for you, so we will talk about those. And then we are going to be looking at um, specific type of mutations that don't lead to actual different phenotype that you can detectable phenotype. They still show up as the wild type or the traditional phenotype. Um, and then finally, we are going to be looking at complementation tests and alleles that are there in um, for a particular phenotype and end with some examples of human mutations. So let's start off uh, understanding the difference between mutation versus polymorphism. So a mutation is any time there's a change in the DNA sequence. Now, when there is a change in the DNA sequence, it doesn't always show up as a phenotype outside, outwardly, right? Uh, sometimes there are altered phenotypes. There's something wrong with the individual or the individual is behaving differently than it would in a normal, typical situation. And in, the, in that case, the response to that mutation is called a mutant phenotype. However, there are many, 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 many types of mutations that don't really cause a deleterious response. And it's just different variations or different flavors of the same gene. So an example would be just like black versus brown hair or eyes or um, just anything at, at the end of the day where different types of DNA sequences are coexisting in different populations at different rates. Um, and those are all just variations of that particular gene that are able to coexist without any issue in that given population. So certain variants of DNA sequences are going to be more prevalent in one population over another. And those sequence, uh, sequences that are at relatively high frequency in a given po um, population are what we call polymorphisms. So they are still changes in DNA sequence of that particular gene, but they are not leading to any response that would be considered outside of the norm, and hence they're not mutants, but rather polymorphisms. However, both polymorphisms as well as mutations are essentially both arising through similar processes. They're both essentially changes in the DNA sequence. Um, the 
only difference being that polymorphisms lead to just the normal trait, a normal behavior, normal biochemical process, while the mutations are going to lead to some harmful effect or some changes, some deleterious change in the way that that particular gene behaves. So how do these mutations form? That's what's important. Obviously, both polymorphisms as well as mutations are both coming from changes in DNA and are, at the end of the day, both mutations, but or could be both mutations, but they are going to happen through, um, they just happen to have a different response at the end of the day. So there are two ways that changes in DNA sequences can happen. You can have them happen spontaneously, so they just kind of randomly occur through the natural process of replication and division, or they can be induced because of exposure to a certain type of uh, agent that can act as a mutagen, that is, that can act as a source of causing mutations because they form, they somehow uh, destroy the DNA sequence through its interaction with the DNA. So there are three different types of mutagens that can do that, that can induce mutations inside the DNA sequence or change the DNA sequence. Um, those are biological, chemical, and physical. And each category comes with a whole variety of different things that can be part of that system. So looking at um, spontaneous versus induced uh, mutations, it is also important to remember where these mutations happen, or kind of consider where these mutations happen. So mutations can happen at two different levels inside our body. One is what we consider um, a mutation that is in any of the cells in our body that are not part of our sexual reproduction system, so not part of one of the germline cells. They're never going to become sperm or eggs. So those type of mutations will affect the individual that is gaining those mutations themselves or could potentially affect that person themselves, but it's not going to affect their progeny. It's never going to be passed down to the later um, the progeny that they might have. So here on this side, on the left side, you can see an example of something like this where the germline cells are completely normal, the individual is completely normal. However, either sometime during the embryo's development, one of the cells becomes mutated and hangs on to that mutation. It's what we call a somatic cell, so it's not a germline cell, it's never going to be an egg or a sperm. And in that case, certain tissues or certain parts of the body are going to have that mutation as it develops into a full organism fully developed organism, while others are not going to be affected at all. And those areas that did have cells that derive, were derived from those mutations would show, would could potentially show the phenotype associated with it um, in various ways. So thinking about a, um, you know, just a different type of maybe a different coloration or any type of phenotype that that particular gene is responsible for. It could also be a gene that is responsible for gene regulation related to cell cycle and could make that individual more prone to, for example, cancer, um, but that would be limited to those areas that it was happening in and not a systemic response. On the other hand, you have a germ cell either a sperm or an egg that contains the mutation to begin with. And in that case, when that mutated cell um, is used to create your zygote or an embryo, the entire embryo is going to be affected. So the entire individual is going to have that mutation, every single cell in their body. And in that case, the individual is going to remain affected throughout their life, and not only will they be affected by it, but they will also be able to pass it down to their future progeny. So that is, um, again, a very important part of looking at how do these mutations occur and where are they? Because that's going to determine if it's going to be something that will affect just the individual in question, or if it is going to be something that is going to affect the downstream progeny and other generations of that individual.
So let's look at how these mutations would occur. And we're just kind of going to go through each one of these um, mutagenic processes that can possibly induce mutations. Some of these can also obviously happen through in a spontaneous manner as well. So the first one is mutations of biological origin. In this case, many of these actually could be what you would see in spontaneously induced somatic mutations as well. These are usually errors during DNA replication. Um, while that is rare, it can occur that there's a temporary misalignment of some bases, just a few bases in the template and daughter uh, strand. This many times occurs when there are repetitive sequences in the genome that are that it is copying, and it can lead to additions or deletions of those repetitive sequences um, because of that strand slippage or that misalignment that happens. Um, so this would be an example of uh, strand slippage would be an example of how this misalignment may occur that because those sequences, it's just a repetitive sequence that happens multiple times, a small misalignment, a slippage of the strand could lead to a little piece of it being looped out or looped in, leading to either deletion of one of those repetitive sequences or an addition of one of those repetitive sequences. So here in this example, you have a small DNA sequence with four CG repeats. And with the strand slippage and misalignment, you, in one case, you end up with the deletion of one of those CG repeats in the process, while in the second one, you end up with gaining another CG repeat in the process. So it is something that can occur. So these short sequence repeats, these tiny sequence repeats, could be as little as just two base pairs that are repeated again and again. Many times it's a three um, nucleotide sequence that is repeated again and again are very polymorphic. So they are very variable precisely because of this problem. So individual to individual or even cell type to cell type, you may see variations in the number of repeats of these small uh, sequences, these short sequence repeats or SSRs. Um, and these regions that have these SSRs um, in them are termed as microsatellites. This becomes a great tool for us as geneticists when we want to do fingerprinting or create a unique fingerprint of a person's DNA, because that's something that's going to be unique to each individual because of the way that they replicate and uh, divide. Another thing that can serve as a biological reaction uh, or biological origin uh, for mutations is transposable elements. So transposable elements, or TES, are also known as jumping genes or mobile genetic elements. They can be present throughout our uh, genome in, and they are present in most organisms. The the reason they are called jumping genes is because they have the ability to be cut or copied depending on what type they are. And then they can go from their original location to another location somewhere else in the genome, hence jumping genes. Um, so they may be present in only one place or they could be present in multiple places if they are being copied. So this process of them getting copied or cut from one place and then integrating into another is called transposition. Um, and while they do that, again, they can be a process where a small piece of our own genome also gets copied along with it or also gets cut and pasted along with it, leading to either disruption of um, the genes that at the start site or at the ending site if it inserts in the middle of a gene. Um, and it can also lead to causing mutations, obviously, in uh, the long run. It is one of the big forces behind evolution and how things adapt and change over time, because obviously they are moving around all the time. And in doing so, they are creating a lot of mutations that can have deleterious or useful beneficial effects, depending on where they are and what they do. There are two main classes of transposable elements in eukaryotic cells. The first one is called class one, 
and they are also called retrotransposons. Uh, they are called retrotransposons because they can have an RNA copy made of them, and then that RNA copy ends up going and pasting somewhere else in the genome. So because of that, um, obviously that means that there is an RNA intermediate somewhere in there, and then that is going to be reverse transcribed into DNA that will then go and insert either in the same place or another location. So in class one transposition, you're going to end up with multiple copies of this transposable element throughout the genome because it is copying and then pasting somewhere else while leaving the original where it is as well. So here is an example of this process. It transcribes into that RNA intermediate that is then reverse transcribed back into DNA that is then integrated either on the same chromosome in the same fragment or somewhere else in a completely different chromosome, completely different place in the genome. So the result would be now two copies of that transposable element instead of the original one. The second class is transposons. Um, the class two transposons work in a different way. In this case, you are not making additional copies of these transposable elements, but rather we're just excising it from where it is now and integrating it in a different location. Now, if it is done perfectly, um, this is trans, you know, this is excised, it's a double-stranded DNA fragment, and then that goes in, in another location. You will not have any traces of it in that first location left behind. However, sometimes there are mistakes, and in the excision, it can leave a little bit behind, or it can take some of your own genome with you. That is one way that mutations can happen inside the genome uh, from these transposable elements. Another way is in the place that it's integrating, which is going to be true both for class one and class two. These transposable elements can go in and integrate in the middle of a gene or in the middle of a sequence that is important for that other gene's function, leading to mutations in that new gene, the where they have come in. So a little bit uh, about these transposable elements. They can be as little as 100 base pairs long, so they can be very, very short, essentially, and they can be as big as 10,000 base pairs, which is still pretty small if you think about genes and DNA sequences in the end. Um, they themselves will encode very few proteins, and any proteins they do encode as, are going to be on about their own function, right? They're going to be related to their own ability to excise or copy or integrate into their other place. So there are three different types of proteins that you can find in transposable elements. The first one is a reverse transcriptase, if it is this um, class one um, transposable element, uh, because that's needed for it to make that RNA copy back into DNA. The second and the third one are going to be present both in class one and class two, which is the transposes and integrates. And just like the word say, transposes allows it to take sides out, and integrase allows it to go back in into another location. Some transposable elements are not going to code for any proteins at all, especially these 100 base pair ones, right? These very short ones are non-autonomous, and so they will not be able to do this all by themselves. But they can transpose if these enzymes are provided to them by the autonomous uh, TEs that are present in that genome. Now, an example of that could be actually even a transposable element that used to be autonomous, but has now, um, you know, had a fragment left behind when it got out, excised out once, and now it's just a small piece, but it may still be able to transpose further if it is recognized by these transposes and integrase and worked with it. Um, these enzymes, uh, the enzymes that are doing this work, whether it is reverse transcriptase, transposes, or integrase, they are recognizing conserved sequences that are within the transposable elements. And so as long as those elements are there in a particular fragment or remnant TE, it is able to be cut and copied by these enzymes. 
um, TEs in humans make about 45% of our genome. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of transposable jumping genes present in our genome. And most of these are class one elements that are called lines and signs. So they are this reverse transcription uh, needing, uh, you know, trans TEs. So these are the retrotransposons that we are working with. These serve, like we said, as important evolutionary force because they can lead to duplication of genes, they can lead to disruptions or deletions or just rearrangement of the genes and the areas around them um, as they excise and integrate in different places. So that's how one big way mutations can occur, especially through biological mechanisms. Okay, so the second category of mutagens is a chemical mutagen. A um, chemical mutagen is any substance that can alter the base sequences that are already there. So it's just changing it maybe from an A to a T or a C or a G. Um, you know, they are changing them by binding to them in some way and changing the hydrogen bonding specificity. So the biggest example of these would be intercalating agents or alkylating agents. Any chemical that changes hydrogen bonding properties of the bases or base analogs. So some of those uh, chemical factor of mutations include benzoyl per uh, peroxide that is very common in many acne products. Um, when we barbecue and have that black, uh, really dark black meat uh, or other things that creates mutagens that are uh, mutagenic chemicals in our food that can do the same thing nitrates and nitrate preservatives and a lot of our foods processed foods that we are eating contain chemicals that can intercalate into our dna or that can go into our dna and act as either base analogs or change the specificity of hydrogen bonding leading to these mutations and there are dozens of mutagens in cigarette smoke that is a well known um, as well so intercalating agents, even in our labs, when we are doing research, there are many compounds we are working with. Um, for example, just using a thidium bromide to examine DNA gels, that thidium bromide is a planar molecule. It intercalates in the DNA and causes um, DNA to have those additions to subtractions of DNA bases and can lead to mutations very easily. And lastly, you, we're going to talk a lot about these chemical and physical mutagens at a later time uh, in a lot more DNA, especially when we talk about DNA repair. So we'll talk about how they happen and then what type of repair mechanisms are there to fix them. But in addition to that, um, so the other uh, thing that can happen is physical mutagen. So chemical mutagen is a chemical that can change hydrogen bonding, specificity that can act as a base analog and take a place of the ba uh, base um, that can intercalate or insert itself in between the bases, right, in the DNA strand and cause an addition because of this uh, thing that is inserted inside. Physical mutagen, on the other hand, is something that can directly interact with the DNA and cause it to somehow be mutagenized, either by causing a break in there or by causing dimers of multiple bases next to each other. So these include ion, ion, uh, ionizing radiation, right? So, or non-ionizing radiation. And in ionizing radiation, it's gonna affect the covalent bondings in the DNA and break them up in many cases and cause uh, DNA breaks, single or double strand breaks. In non-ionizing radiation, like the UV light, it can cause um, thymidine dimers, so two thymidines next to each other, cause uh, getting kind of cross-linked with each other so that now it's going to not be able to have the normal interaction that it needs to have in the double-stranded DNA, and that area will bulge out and lead to mutations. Um, so at the end of the day, the mutations are caused that are caused by mutagenic reagents include all of these different properties that we just talked about other than the biological reasons where we talked about the TEs and the mutations happening spontaneously inside or otherwise you can also actually have some viruses that can uh, 
um, also act uh, as mutagenic agents uh, over time or in immediate pace. You have radiation such as x-rays, UV radiation, microwave uh, radiation. You have chemicals like the ones we have in cigarette smoke and lighter fluid and fuel, paint, bug sprays, a lot of our, um, you know, preservatives, a lot of our pesticides, a lot of our cleaner, household cleaners, all of those can have agents inside them, chemicals inside them that can act as mutagen. And it's extremely important that we are aware of those so that we know when and where to protect ourselves from these um, very important issues are uh, mutagenic agents. So before we go into genetic screening, I'm actually gonna um, stop this lecture right here so that you can have a kind of a nice clean break for it. Um, and then in the next part that I will post, I will talk about genetic screenings. How do we actually look for these um, things? How do we look for these transposable elements? How do we look for these mutations that may have occurred? And how do we find out what to do with them? How do we use them for our advantages as geneticists as well? And how do we use them to maybe um, isolated fragment of DNA that we don't know about and sequence it as well? So that's going to be part two of this lecture.